God, I just thank you for Alf, for the friend he is to us and the father figure. Just pray you'd bless his words today by your Holy Spirit. Thank you for that the, his words are from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Joel. Well, we're going to look for a few minutes today. I can say a few minutes now. Um, from the book of James. How many of, uh, for, how many has James been a, a favorite book in your life? If you're a, if you're a Bible person, yeah, there's a few. James is kind of a controversial book, if you didn't know. Um, it's, uh, there was some question as to whether it would be included, actually. I don't know if you know this, but when they put the Bible together, there was a whole lot of, um, of, of writings that were considered and so on. And uh, by all the scholars of the day, uh, we did them down to a certain uh, group, which we now have as our Bible. And so um, I've gone through, I look back at, uh, you know, the last several years, and I've gone through at different times, verse by verse, eight books of the New Testament. How many knew that? Eight books. Wow. Of the New Testament that we've gone through verse by verse here in the church. And uh, I'm not going to teach James that way, but what I thought I would do is I would sort of take some themes from the book of James. And so I thought I'd take the most controversial one right off the top. And that's, that's uh, the title today is Faith That Works. And James was, uh, the, the controversy about James was that um, he's advocating, and I'll show you, uh, we'll see that today, that you have to do something in order to, or doing something proves your faith. Doing something at that faith by itself, James says, is dead. But faith with works. And so, in the, in the Reformation days, Martin Luther struggled greatly with this, with this uh, book. In fact, some quotes from him. Um, he, he, he once offered his doctor's cap to anyone who could reconcile it with the just shall live by faith. You know, his, his doctorate, you know, is the symbol of his, of his education. He said, you can have my doctor's hat if you, can, if you can reconcile James with the just shall live by faith, which, of course, was Martin Luther's big, big revelation. It was the Reformation, 1517 and so on, and uh, the, the Protestant Reformation and so on. And so... Um, he, and, and after he offered that, he scoffed at his friends for trying. So several people tried. I don't know if they just wanted to, to prove him wrong or they wanted his doctor's hat. I'm not sure. But at any rate, he called James an epistle of straw that has nothing of the nature of the gospel to it. Whoa. So, <laughs> so I think we can understand his, his opposition to it, I guess because of the great revelation that he had that the just shall live by faith. You see, the church of the day um, had a whole pile of qualifications and works that you had to do to earn your salvation. The church of the day was very, very works-driven. You could not only earn your salvation, but the thing I think that pushed Martin over the top was that you could buy indulgences, you could buy pieces of paper for your dearly departed loved ones if you weren't sure they were in heaven, you could buy, buy something from the church, you know, you know, give money to the church, and they would give you a piece of paper, which, you know, I guess guaranteed a shorter stay in purgatory or whatever. It was kind of a convoluted thing, but the whole system that he lived in, Martin himself was a monk, and he would, he would, um, he would do pilgrimages on his knees. He would crawl upstairs, you know, long, you know, building stone you know, and on his knees to, to prove his humility or to his piety or his, and, and everything he did just didn't really seem to bring him closer to God. Aren't you glad we don't have to do that anymore? So his great revelation was the just are not, are not uh, living by their works or we're not justified by our works. We're justified by faith. And so his, one of his big scriptures was Romans 3.28 that says, you know, it's, it's obvious to us that the just shall live by their faith, not by the works of the law. And so 
Paul, of course, was talking about the old covenant law and, you know, the sacrificial law and all the, the, the additions to the law that the Pharisees had, had added over the hundreds and hundreds of years. And uh, that the, the, the Jewish religion or the old covenant believed that you must do in order to be right with God. So, so Martin, anyways, what often happens when you get a great revelation is you swing the pendulum way over to the other side. And you say, no, no, works mean nothing. It's all faith. All right? Well, James kind of preaches um, middle of the road. Like, I love you. We'll, we'll read it more in, in detail later. But he says, you know, you say, well, you have works and I have faith. You know, and he says, yeah, but you can't show me your faith except by your works. I'll show you that I have faith by my works. And it's not the works of the law. It's not following a law code or crawling on your knees up stone steps. You know, that's not the deal. It's, well, we'll see what it is. So, Martin and his, uh, his great revelation swung the pendulum way out. And James, he couldn't, he, he didn't like James because James is arguing for that works have something to do with it. But James is not talking about salvation by works. He's not talking about that. You don't earn your salvation. But he's te- when he teaches about faith that works, but he teaches that having faith in God and what God says about us and about the world and his, his position toward us and our position toward him, if we have faith in God and his word to us, our lifestyle will naturally produce the works that James is talking about. Because, we're, because if we really have faith, our lifestyle will change in a way to line up with that faith. And those are the works that he's talking about. So he makes the case, James does, we'll see, that doing good or living a lifestyle of of good uh, um, is an indicator of our faith level. That's a little bit scary, isn't it? You know, um, but he makes that case and we're going to make it today. So, First off, faith needs to be tested in order to grow. Here's a favorite scripture for sure, I think, of all of you. James 1, starting at chapter 2. Dear brothers and sisters, when trouble of any, to- of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. How many memorize that and just wave that as a flag all the time? You know, yes, every time I'm in big trouble, I just I celebrate with great joy, right? Oh, it's a tough one, isn't it? So I said, he's an interesting second verse in, and he just goes right for that, right? Way to go, James. But he says, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Why? Verse 3, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Well, that sounds good, doesn't it? Doesn't that sound right? You'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. When your faith has been tested and your endurance has grown. Passion in verse 3 says, for, when, for you know that when your faith is tested, it stirs up power within you to endure all things. So while you may not be happy about the test that's happening or rejoice you know, greatly, yes, I'm so happy that I'm sick, or whatever it is, or that I got fired, or that uh, my car broke down, I'm so happy. It's not that. It's say, look at it from this side. It is giving you a chance to act on your faith in God. Because testing, how are we tested? We're tested by being given opportunities to act out of our faith, out of our belief in God, and out of our belief in what God says about us, we're, we're giving opportunities to respond to whatever it is that comes our way based on the word of God, or will we act out of our own insecurity, act out of what the devil says about us, act about what the world, act, you know, out of what the world says about us. So endurance, why is endurance important? How many here are runners? Anybody here a runner? How many like to run distances? Yeah? Forget it? No? No running? Listen, I've never been a runner either, but I know several. I know several. And when you train 
to run a marathon, let's say, that's kind of the ultimate. I guess now the ultimate would be the triathlon or the super Ironman or whatever it is. They keep making new ones, you know. Run seven marathons in seven days. I don't know. There's, people are crazy, okay? So, you know. I don't know why you torture yourself. But here's the thing about endurance. When a person first decides he's been a couch potato all his life, okay, then he decides, I'm going to be a marathon runner. So he gets up off, off his couch, and he goes outside, and he walks a couple blocks, and he comes home and goes, I'm exhausted. Whatever made me think I could run a marathon? But he perseveres, and he goes on and on and on, and he tests. He tests himself. He extends the limit. He starts to run. He starts to jog. He starts to run. And pretty soon, you know what he notices? He notices that what used to just about kill him the first day, it's pretty simple now. It's become a breeze. And so he extends it longer and longer, and he runs 5Ks, and he runs 10Ks. You know, the city here puts on, you know, there's various runs you can get involved in that aren't marathons that won't kill you. But, you know, but, you, know you can pretty soon, 5K, it's nothing. Like, I mean, it's tough, it's, but I love it. It's exhilarating. It's great. You know, it's, there's a high involved in pushing your body physically like that when, you're, when you've had endurance training. See, the, the goal of endurance, the goal of endurance of your faith is that what used to just about kill you is now pretty easy. That's what endurance is about. You see, because when you have endurance, when you let endurance become part of your lifestyle, and, and you've allowed your faith to be tested so that you, you build up endurance, what used to knock you off your, your pony pretty easily now is, is, is pretty easy, you know? Because that's God's goal for you. He doesn't want you knocked over every time somebody looks at you the wrong way, right? He doesn't want you to be put, you know, down in the dumps every time everything doesn't go perfect for you. He wants you to have endurance. And so he tests your faith. Testing, just like learning to run, learning to build up endurance in running, testing and running and continuous practice builds up endurance. The goal being that it becomes easier and easier to do the thing that you've set out to do, right? So endurance is important. Notice in, this, in the scripture it says, for you know that when your faith is tested. How many noticed that it didn't say, so if your faith ever gets tested, it's when. Your faith will be tested. How you're going to grow through it and whether you're going to develop endurance or not depends on how you're going to embrace it. Are you going to, you see, because a test is an opportunity to take the faith that you have and act on it. Even if that action is just making a decision, I will not listen to that lie anymore. You know, it's, it's not all about physical actions. It's about deciding to actually live by what I say I believe. All right? So the word that comes to my mind, and I, I looked it up because I wanted to, because I like the way the dictionary defined it, actually, it's the word congruent. We want to have a lifestyle that's congruent with our stated faith. James is going to let you know that just because you say something, and we've said this so many times, I think I got it out of James, but you can say anything you want to. How you live is, is what you really believe, right? But we want a lifestyle that is congruent with our stated faith, okay? So congruent means similar to or in agreement with something so that two things can both exist or can be combined without problems. See, Martin had a huge problem combining faith and works because, you see, his background was all about Work, 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 work to prove that you're a Christian or to earn your salvation or to earn your uncle. Or, I was going to say your uncle Ernie. Is there an Ernie here? Way out of hell or something. You know, like, I mean, that, that's the way it was then, right? So he comes from this background of work, work, slave, slave, crawl around in the dust on your knees to prove how pious you are. He comes to, ah. Oh, we're made right by God, with God because we just have faith in what Jesus did for us. That's why we're right with God. And, and it's not by works. And so he couldn't see faith and works being congruent. But James says they are. He states, in fact, 
emphatically that they can be mingled together, and actually they must be mingled together. All right, verse uh, 22 of chapter 1 says, don't just listen to God's word, you must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. Again, you can say anything you want to, you know. You can say, you know, I can beat up Tony, you know, but uh, <laughs> I probably can't. I can say anything I want to, but if, unless I actually go ahead and try to do it, no one will ever know if I can or not. You see, you can say anything, you know. I'm the toughest guy there ever was. Oh, yeah? Wait till uh, Charlie DeVries comes over to my house. <laughs> Oops. You can say anything. How you live is actually what you believe. So it's not that we shouldn't say things, because we're in process, aren't we? No. God hasn't given up on us, so why, why would we give up on ourselves? We're in process. We're learning. I surrender all, except for, uh, let me think now, you know, I mean, it, it's good to say those things, and to, but how we actually live is what we actually believe, okay? That's what James is saying. You must do what it says, otherwise you're only fooling yourself. So if we listen to God's word, See, what James is doing is actually just repeating Jesus' teaching on the wise and foolish carpenter. You must take these words of mine and work them into your life. If you just use them, as the message says in Matthew 7, you know, if you just take these words of mine and use them in Bible studies, but don't actually change the way you live, you know, you're the foolish carpenter. And when trouble comes, your house will collapse. How many want their house to collapse when they have trouble? No. So the key to having your house survive trouble which will come, because when your faith gets tested, not if, when your faith is tested, will your house stand? Well, that depends. Have you worked, have you acted on what you've been taught? That's why we keep on pounding on the Bible. I know it's strange, you know, that we should preach the Bible, but we keep pounding on that because these words need to be worked into our life. The last, you know, two times, a, a life of thanksgiving and gratitude needs to be worked into our life because that's how God designed us to thrive. If we're miserable and grumbly and negative all the time and critical, well, we're, that's not the way to thrive. And, you know, we want to be a, a community together because God designed for us. to. It's not good for people to be alone. But we need to be figure out how to be a, a community together. And we need to learn how to act in a way that accurately reflects our stated belief, our faith, okay? And so, if we just listen to God's word and keep living lives our own way, for our own ends, James says we're fooling ourselves about whether or not we really have faith. Wow. These guys are pretty blunt, you know? I like, uh, I like James and John, the little epistles close to the end of the, of the book. Uh, John also, you know, he says, uh, well, if you say this, you're a liar, <laughs> you know, and the truth of God is not in you. I mean, tell us what you really think, you know, and James is the same way, you know. He says, if you, if you don't do what the word of God says, you're fooling yourself. You don't really have faith. If you listen and just live your life your own way, you don't really have faith. Are you saved? We're not talking about being saved. We're talking about, are you actually functioning in faith as you say you are? So we want a faith that works. When I say faith that works, I'm not talking about, you know, the faith that you need to get a healing or whatever. So, you know, we, we pray, we pray in faith. Somebody doesn't get healing. Man, I want a faith that works. That, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about faith that is backed up by the way that we act and the way that we think and the way that we behave. Because how we behave is showing what we really believe, no matter what we say. Have I said that enough? Faith that works. So James gives us an example in chapter 2. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? Wow, I mean, that's an interesting concept, but how does how we treat people, 
does that have to do with faith? How can you say, how can you claim to have faith in Jesus if you favor some people over others? How, how does that work? Well, for example, oh, I'm certainly going to tell you. For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and in dirty clothes. You give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you stand over there or sit, or else sit on the floor. Well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? How is having faith re related to how we treat people? Jesus, or James uses this example to show us that how we act is a real indicator, a true indicator of our faith level. See, our faith is not in faith, you know. Our faith must be based on God's word to us, right? All the heroes of the faith that are mentioned, and I'm going to, James goes into, you know, one of them here, Abram, which we'll touch on in a minute. He, he responded to a word that God gave him, right? He, he wasn't, you know, faith in some ideal about God. He acted on a specific word that God gave him, right? Okay, get into that in a bit. So our faith must be based on God's word to us. So have you heard God tell you who you are? It's a, it's a basic element of human existence. Who am I? What is my identity? No, did you know that, I don't know if you've been around this place very long, but did you know that nobody can tell you who you are except your father who is in heaven? Nobody has any right to tell you who you are. Oh, we can talk about each other. Oh, you're a great guy, or you're this, or you're that. You're my favorite, you know, person. I, I had five kids, so I used to say all the time, you are my favorite daughter whose name is Andrea. And, you know, and I had to sort of always qualify it in case the other ones were listening, you know. But so we can talk to each other and so on. But who we really are, is established by God who formed you in your mother's womb, put you intricately together, not just your physical, your emotional, your spiritual, your soul. He put you together in a specific way. Only he can tell you who you are. If you haven't heard that, you need to hear that from your father. Because you see, you only have faith in something when God has spoken a word to you. That's when you can really act on it. What is the source of our provision? How many people can confidently rest in the fact that God is your provision? I'm learning to, you know. I'm learning to every day. I'm a lot further than I was 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 5 years ago. Last night. No, maybe not that much further. But what is the source of our identity? Who is the source of our provision? Can we say like David in Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. Or as the message says, God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. Wow. What a wonderful place to be. I don't need a thing. Because God is my shepherd. Because God watches, you know, God is my father, as we say. So treating rich people better than poor people or important people better than less important people shows that we're lacking in the area of understanding and having faith in God's word to us about who we are and about who will provide for us. That's why James throws this example in there. Because if we're looking at somebody favorably because they're rich or important and, 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 and you know, unfavorably because somebody is poor and unimportant, what we're actually saying, what we're deep down inside, you would never admit to this, you know, I'm going to admit to it in a minute, but you would never, and that is that if you do that, what you're looking for is you're looking to get, you can gain something from them. It might be financial, it might be affirmation, it might be that they'll put a good word in for you, it might be all kinds of things. You know that the poor and unimportant person could never benefit you, so why treat him nice? So he says, if you treat people differently, he says, James says, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? Ooh, scary business. 
Oh, my goodness. I used to sit in meetings years ago, and when there was an important person speaking or somebody who was highly looked up to or, you know, important in our movement or whatever, I used to sit there and just subconsciously, sometimes even consciously, just hope like everything that in the course of his speaking or his message, he would mention me. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that awful? I thought, because I didn't know who I was yet. I didn't. I've been a Christian. I had been a Christian at that point for 20 years. And I didn't know that I was a son of the king of the universe. I didn't know that. You see, I was grasping for identity from somebody who I looked up to. Now, it's not wrong to, you know, to, to honor people and to put honor on people where honor is due and so on. But if you're, if you're sitting there treating somebody special, buttering somebody up because there's something in it for you, you may not admit it, but I just did. But there's nothing wrong with showing honor. It's the motivation that James is after. Is your motivation coming from an evil place? In other words, something you can get out of them. Or is it coming from an actual genuine place of honor? So we're exercising our faith when we treat everyone the same. I hope that means every, equally good, not equally bad. Some people say, I treat everyone the same. All bad. So our faith is working, are being exercised when we treat everyone the same. We're saying that God is my father. He's the provider of all I need. He's the one who tells me who I am. Nobody else. Nobody else. James chapter 2 and verse, carrying on with that story in verse 8, it says, yes, indeed, it's good when you obey the royal law as found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you favor some people over others, you're committing a sin. How many people have ever favored someone over someone else because they were more important or rich or famous or whatever? Oh, my goodness. I know you have, it's a sin, and you're guilty of breaking the law. What law is he talking about? He just mentioned it. It's good when you obey the royal law found in Scripture. Love your neighbor as yourself. We don't want to, we don't want to be breaking the, you know, Jesus only gave us a couple of laws. Like, you know, we, we, we don't want to be breaking them, do we? Love God with everything you have and love your neighbor as yourself. It's good when you treat people equally and love your neighbor as yourself. But if you favor some people over others, James says, you're committing a sin. The message says, but if you play up to these so-called important people, you go against the rule and stand convicted by it. So how we treat others is an indication of or an outworking of our faith or lack of it. This is what James is saying. That's why he gives this example, because he's about to launch into the whole, let's get right at it, faith and works. So verse 14, dear friends, do you think you'll get anywhere in this if you learn all the right words, but never do anything? Wow. Does merely talking about faith indicate that a person really has it? Yes? No? No. All right. Verse 15 says, for example, if a brother or sister in the faith is poorly clothed and hungry, and you leave them saying goodbye, I hope you stay warm and have plenty to eat but you don't provide them with a coat or even a cup of soup, what good is your faith? So then faith that doesn't involve action is phony. Wow. That was the passion. I like the message too. It says, isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense? Whoa. Like, let's get right at it. Let's not sugarcoat it. Let's not be, you know, let's not be gentle with you guys, you know. If, you're just, if, you're, if, if your religion is just talk and no action, that's outrageous nonsense. Wow. Okay. So let's carry on. Something I started to quote earlier, verse 18. Some people, uh, now someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I'll show you my faith by my good deeds. If you say you have faith and you believe there's one God, well, good for you. Even the demons believe this and they tremble in terror. <laughs> we sang about that. You know, how many want to be lined up with the demons? Like, 
They know that there's one God and he's almighty and he's, gonna, he's one and they're going to lose. Like they know that. So if that's, all, if that's the extent of our belief, well, good for you. You believe the same way that the demons do. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Verse 20, useless. Not has some kind of minor mediocre quality about, no, it's useless. Faith without good deeds. Verse 21, he goes into some examples now. Now, he, he's given us two examples. Um, you know, when someone walks in your meeting and they look important and so on, or, or you meet somebody in, who's a brother and sister in the faith and they're hungry and cold and you don't help them. You know, so those are sort of like almost minor league incidents compared to what Abraham had to go through. But he, he throws in Abraham because he, he did huge things that had earth-shaking, history-making, um, you know, consequences of, his, of Abraham's decisions. You know, and, he, and he's going to get into it here. But he says, you know, he, he gives us these little minor, little minor league little tests of faith. And then he throws in Abraham. He's kind of the major leagues. But verse 21, don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. So if you just have faith, you just talk, you've learned all the right words, it's incomplete. What makes your faith complete is when you act on that faith, when you act in such a way. So when you, when you treat everyone the same and you don't you know, suck up to somebody because you can get something from them, you know, because there's benefit in it for you. You know, it, it, you know if, you, if, you, if you just treat everyone the same, you're acting on the faith that God tells me who I am. You can't tell me who I am. I don't care if it's the prime minister walked in here and said, oh, you're an amazing speaker. You know, I mean, he probably would. But, you know, like, I, I, don't, I don't care if he would or not. Because my father who created the blinking universe calls me his son. So nobody can beat that, right? And so, Abraham, whatever you think about that story and God asking Abraham to do what he did, the point is, Abraham heard God say something, a word to him, God's word to him, and then he acted on it. Let's go back a little bit, because Hebrews talks a little bit about Abraham um, in the chapter, in the faith chapter, Hebrews 11 Verse 8 says, By faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. I love that. Abraham, go to a place that I'm going to give you. Uh, some direction would be good. No, just go. If you're moving in the wrong direction, I'll correct you. I think that was basically the, you know, what was happening. So he went out not knowing where he was going. I mean, we at least like to know when we set out somewhere where we're going. This is helpful, right? How will you know when you get there if you don't know where you're going? But Abraham, was he, his faith was so complete in God's word to him and in God's character and in who God had showed himself to be to Abraham that he said yes, and his action verified his faith. If he'd have said, excuse me, that's a ridiculous request, sir. When you send me more detailed instructions, I might consider your proposal. But he didn't do that, did he? In the same way, in verse 17 of Hebrews 11, by faith Abraham is talking about the same story now that James was talking about. When he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise was offering up his only begotten son. It was he, it was this son to whom it was said, in Isaac, your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. So Abraham goes on, and, and you can imagine the test of his faith. I mean, you know, the test of faith of treating all people the same or giving someone a cup of soup is not quite up there with this level, right? You can imagine the test of faith when God said to Abraham, take your son and go to a place and sacrifice your son. 
You see, and, and Abraham's faith in God was so complete that he said, you know, God promised me that through Isaac, not Ishmael, who he'd had earlier, but through Isaac is the promise, is the covenant. That's where is going, that's what's, you know, moving forward. The people of God are going to come through my son Isaac. Now, he's asked me to, to kill him, so I guess, because I have such faith in God, I guess he's going to raise him from the dead. I guess that's what he's going to do. Because otherwise, you know, there's no other way. He promised me that Isaac would be, you know, the one. And so his faith was so strong in, his, in who God is and what God is capable of and who, you know, God had showed himself to Abraham that he was able to do this horrible thing, really. I mean, he was saved from doing it, wasn't he? You know, just so you, you didn't know the story. God stops him. He just says, now that I know that you have not withheld every, even your most precious, even your own son, I know that you really have faith in me. And so these are big. These are major league tests. I think Abram had a few minor league tests before this point. Um, but, you know, he, he, he passed the test and he showed, he proved that he had faith in God by doing something. And this is James' point. So, yeah. He was willing to do because he had faith in God's word to him. See, all through Hebrews 11, the heroes of the faith, they got to be named as heroes because they did something. All of them. You, you read through it. Hebrews 11, verse 2 says, the act of faith is what, the act of faith is what distinguished our ancestors and set them above the crowd. The acts proved that they had faith. They had faith that works. So it's not about trying to keep a whole set of laws or, or rules or, you know, like the old covenant or even trying to run around doing as many good deeds as possible to try to prove you have faith. God doesn't want you to try to prove you have faith. He's saying that what you do proves where your faith's at. And, and I, want you, I want your faith to grow. I want your endurance to grow. So we're going to test you. And the test might be, you know, I want you to go over there and give, you know, Michael Peace in a hug. You know, well, that's not a very, that's not very hard, except uh, it's COVID. So, you know, we probably won't, but at this point, but, <laughs> but, you know, it might be something very simple. Do we have faith that if God tells us to do something, there's some significance to it and we should just do it? Or do we, uh, do we second guess all the time? We go, you know, like, uh, again, if Abraham had said, you know what, God, whew, I mean, listen, you, you, you sent me on a journey without telling me where I was going, and I went. But this, this is just too much. This is too much for me. I can't do this. Well, the whole history of the nation of Israel would have gone in a different direction because God would have just taken up with somebody else. Maybe God did take up with someone else before he found Abraham. We don't know the whole story yet. But Abraham, you see, got to be the patriarch, not only of the nation of Israel, but of everyone, Paul tells us in Galatians, everyone who is of the faith in Jesus is now heir of the promises that were made to Abraham. So Abraham is our father as well, and so on. So he made cataclysmic you know, events transpired because of his decision, because of his faith to do what God told him to do. His faith had to take action. You know, he could have, there was no point in him arguing with God. No, no, I have faith in you. I have faith in you. But uh, I'm just, I'm just, nah, I'm not going to do that. See, that wouldn't have worked. That would have proved he didn't have faith in God, really, to that level. That would have proved he needed more, in her, more endurance yet. So, yeah, once we know our identity and we're secure as a child of God, once we can embrace his promises to us that he'll provide for us, we can treat everyone as important people. We can give anybody who God asks us to a cup of soup, a jacket, whatever it is that's needed. And, and I mean, it's just talking about, you know, the, you know the, the, it doesn't only mean to help homeless people. It doesn't only mean to help people who are poor. It means just do what your father asks you to do. It proves your faith. 
doing it. Proves your faith in him and you're resting and you're relaxing in his opinion of you and his provision for you. See, what you have, no one can take from you. No one can add anything to you except it's from God. Nobody can. Whatever you think you might get from somebody else pales in comparison to what your father has for you. So the extent or strength of my faith and how my father sees me will naturally work its way out into my lifestyle, into my actions. So how does our faith get tested, get strengthened? By being tested. By encountering opposition. When your faith is tested. Let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Endurance is good. Endurance is good. How many want to continually be taken out by the same things over and over and over again? No. I want, it. I want it. endurance to be built in me. So I will embrace testing. I will rejoice in the fact that my endurance is growing, even though it's painful sometimes to go through tests, isn't it? So is my salvation earned by the good things that I do? Is it? No. This is not what James is talking about. It's not about salvation. We're talking about faith that works. We're talking about our action being a genuine expression of our faith. So what's God's goal for us? James stated it earlier. He wants you to be perfect and complete, needing nothing. He wants you to say with David, God is my shepherd. I don't need a thing. I'm good. Right? How do we get there? How do we get to his goal? By testing. Being given opportunities to act in a way that genuinely expresses our faith. I want to cultivate in my life a faith that works. We want our actions to be consistent and based on our belief and our faith in our Father. What he says about us and his promises to us. Amen? Can we handle that? Faith and works are congruent. They can be combined and mixed with no problem. Amen. Father, thank you that you're so clear in your word about how you want us to live. You want us to live by faith. Yes, the just shall live by faith. Yes, we're justified by faith. But the level of our faith when we first start is not where you want to take us is not where you want us to end. You want our faith to grow, and our faith is grown by testing and by being able to consciously take actions based on our faith in you and your word. We want to live that lifestyle because that builds a house that will stand no matter what happens. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.